All right, this first session, we are going to cover this topic, the biblical principles of civil government. And I do apologize for the bounce in the room. I wish we had uh, uh, sound suppressing uh, on the back wall, but, but we just don't. So we will try to be a little bit more measured as we present each statement to make it as understandable as possible. This presentation, the majority of it, should be in your notebook. We also have it in, in Spanish. Uh, if it's not your notebook, we will have that on our website, so that will be available. And again, as we share all of this, <clears throat> on Wednesday morning, we're going to give some simple next steps. If you want to join as part of this Brotherhood of Pastors Across America, uh, we will have all this information available to you on our websites, and it will be available for you to preach to your churches. You can use our PowerPoint slides, and all this material will be for you to have access to. <clears throat> this statue is called the National Monument to the Forefathers. It's largely been forgotten. In fact, if not for Kirk Cameron's movie Monumental back in 2012, I wouldn't even know it existed. But it stands in a nondescript <clears throat> residential neighborhood in uh, Plymouth overlooking Cape Cod Bay. And on the front facade, it says this, National Monument to the Forefathers, erected by a grateful people in remembrance of their labor, sacrifices, and sufferings for the cause of civil and religious liberty. The point I want to make as we begin is that civil and religious liberty travel as twins. When you lose one, you lose both. You can't say, oh, we can be socialists and we can still keep our church. No, you can't, and I'll explain why in just a moment. One of the most influential men of our founding fathers actually, as Dan mentioned last night, was the president of Princeton University, and he was a minister. He was uh, part of the Continental Congress. He was very influential founding father and member of the origins of our country. As a matter of fact, under his leadership at Princeton, or what was in Long College, we had 49 future U.S. congressmen trained, 28 future U.S. senators, 12 future governors, 12 future members of the Continental Congress, uh, three future Supreme Court justices, one future vice president, and one future president, all trained in a biblical worldview by the Reverend John Witherspoon. Witherspoon made this statement, there is not a single instance in, which, in history in which civil liberty was lost and religious liberty was preserved. Now we know this to be true when we think about Christian history. Christianity has always been persecuted. First, persecuted by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem then persecuted by pagan Rome and the pagan Roman Empire, then persecuted by the Holy Roman Catholic Empire. Down throughout the ages around the world, even today in communist countries and in Muslim countries, there is no such thing as religious liberty. Christianity is persecuted only in the United States of America. And only for the last 240 years have we been able to enjoy civil and religious liberty. So what we think is the rule is not. What we have here in the United States is exceptional. We are the exception to the rule. So why is America different? First of all, you must understand that for a tyranny to be successful, before someone can control your body physically, <clears throat> they first must take control of your mind. So totalitarians will come in and first thing, seek to nationalize education. Because as a Christian, you are taught to raise your children to trust the Lord, that all of our rights come from God, and we're to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But beginning in 1962 and 1963 in the United States of America, we did away with prayer and Bible in school. Basically what we did is we went from a biblical worldview to a Darwinian, atheistic, socialistic worldview, and now, some 60 years later, we're seeing the product of that. As we teach our kids that there is no God, there is no right and wrong, and all of our rights come from government. The second thing a totalitarian state must do is control the flow of information. We are all sitting here today in Orlando, Florida. What a lovely city, what a lovely hotel. We have no idea what's going on in Los Angeles. We have no idea what's going on in Beirut. We have no idea what's going on even in our hometowns today because we're not there to, eye, to be eyewitnesses. We have to trust the flow of information. And we will either be inflamed to rage or be sound asleep, calm as kittens, based upon what information we receive and how it's presented to us. 
Then the third thing, there can be no freedom of conscience. Nothing can tell you that whatever the government does is wrong. Everything the government does is right. You cannot have the right to disagree with the government because the government is never morally wrong under a totalitarian state. Therefore, you cannot have the freedom of worship. Therefore, the government must control what is preached in the churches if churches are allowed at all. So either you have two types of systems. You either have an atheistic communism as they have in China or in the former Soviet Union where there is no God, so by default government becomes God. Government grants rights, government takes rights away, government establishes what truth is, and there's no higher appeal than the government. If there's not an atheistic communism, you have a theocracy, as they have in Iran, where you come to the same end. God and government are one and the same. Government grants rights. Government takes rights away. Uh, government establishes what's right and wrong, and there's no higher appeal than government. Think back biblically, pastors. That's exactly what Nimrod sought to establish in ancient Babel. That's what Nebuchadnezzar had successfully established in Babylon when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves in the fiery furnace. And that's what King James had established in Old England. As the king, he was the political leader of the land, but as the head of the Church of England, he was the spiritual leader of the land as well. And if you disagreed with the king, not only was it an act of heresy, but it was also an act of treason for which you could be imprisoned, beaten, or even put to death. It was for that reason that this little group boarded a little ship called the Mayflower and sailed to the New World. Now this painting done by Michael Weir hangs in the rotunda in the United States Capitol. And up, you'll notice in the center of this painting is a depiction of the New Testament. Actually, the Geneva Bible opened to the first page of the New Testament. As they are there, you see uh, John Carver. You see uh, uh, John, uh, William Bradford back here in the back. You see Elder Brewster. You see their pastor, James Robinson, Miles Standish over here, all praying to God. Historical account when they left Holland, beginning their journey to the New World. Now this group of Christians had a comprehensive biblical worldview, and they knew that God established three institutions on planet earth. If you ask any pastor in America, fresh out of seminary, he'll answer this question correctly. God created three institutions on planet earth. What are they? Well first there's the home, then there's the church, and then there is this institution called civil government. And if you ask any pastor in America, Pastor, where do you get counsel on how your home should function? If somebody came for you for premarital counseling or was having marital problems and they came to you for help, where would you go? Well, since God created this institution called the home, you would go to the pages of Scripture and see what God had to say about it. Likewise, when you set up your church... Most likely, you're the reason you do things the way you do. Your covenant and bylaws, your doctrinal statements also come from the pages of Scripture because God established the local New Testament church. Now, for some reason, when you ask a modern-day pastor, where do you go for proper instruction on proper civil government, his mind goes into outer space, and he says, I guess MSNBC. Now, does this make any sense whatsoever? It does not. Well, the history is, as was recounted by the historian John Palfrey, that in the great Puritan migration, which followed the pilgrims coming, Palfrey recorded that the Puritans searched the Bible for principles and for examples that they could incorporate into their new system of American civil law, into their system of jurisprudence. As a matter of fact, would it surprise you if I told you that in their day, pastors, being the most educated, well-read men, were looked to for leadership and principles of government and politics. As a matter of fact, government, our pastors, were political experts of the day. As Dan shared with you last night, this happens to be a sample of a sermon that was preached by Pastor David Parsons, an election sermon to the newly seated legislature of the state of Massachusetts at a time when John Hancock was the governor of the state of Massachusetts. 
as this new Congress was seated, a pastor would come in and address them as ministers of God, as it says in Romans 13, ministers of God to the people for their good. And he would lay down the law as to what God expected out of them and what their obligation was as a legislature for that session. As a matter of fact, the historian Alice Baldwin wrote in her great book, The New England Clergy and the American Revolution, that it was these sermons which were reproduced and spread throughout the colonies, and they became the textbooks on politics that trained the people, the three million citizens of America, and the things that led up to their thinking for the Declaration of Independence and our war for independence. As a matter of fact, these things... These biblical truths that we have in America are in fact exceptional, and we have only had them in America. The fundamental principle that all men are created equal did not come out of old England, as I said last night. That was the pilgrim in the Puritan worldview. All men are equal at the foot of the cross. The Church of England believed in the lords and the nobles and the commoners and then there's the lower classes and of course the king was on top with his divine right of ruling. Uh, the concept of natural law came from the Bible. The definition of the family comes from the Bible. Our laws of morality come from the pages of scripture. Ownership and private property rights, that didn't come from old England. In old England, it was the king's dale and the king's forest and the king's army and the king's navy and the king's deer. And you were, in fact, the king's subject. But in the pages of Scripture, as the Israelites, every man had his own home. And in America, every man was king of his own castle. Right to a fair trial. No conviction without two or three witnesses. A punishment that fits the crime, i.e., an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The Republican form of government is found in Exodus chapter 18 when Moses was busy leading those two million Jews out uh, through the wilderness and one day he, uh, his father-in-law Jethro came and visited him and observed that there was a line of people lined up waiting to have Moses adjudicate some disagreement between uh, these Jewish comrades. Well, his father-in-law said, you're not doing yourself any favor and you're also not serving the people. Here's what you need to do. Uh, 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 Raise up from among you or call out from among you capable men. Choose out from among you capable men that fear God, love truth, and hate covetousness. Teach them the rule of law and let them be judges over tens and over fifties and over hundreds and over thousands. That is the creation of the Republican form of government. And then having a constitution, a divine or written rule of law came from the pages of Scripture. America was exceptional, not perfect as we addressed last night. We're still not perfect. But we're one country that generally tries to get it right when we recognize that we're doing it wrong. But America was exceptional because at least at our outset, we were established on a solid biblical worldview. Now, there are three things I want to cover this morning very briefly that they knew and took to heart that we don't know but must remember. Number one, the whole purpose of government was for the good of the people. Pastor John Davenport, pastor of First Church in Boston, said in 1663, government was ordained of God, and its purpose, like the government in Christ and of God himself, was the good of the people. Well, where did you come up with that idea? Well, every place in the Bible that talks about civil government. Romans chapter 1, for example, Dan will get into in great detail. The whole idea of those realms of government that I talked about last night were God's and came from the pages of Scripture. You want to know what the purpose of the civil government is? The rulers are not to terrorize those that do good works, but they're to be a terror to those that do evil. For those rulers are actually ministers of God to thee for good. So if you're doing something evil, then you have cause to be afraid. But if you're not, then you have nothing to worry about. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Paul, in his love, and we see the establishment of civil government. After Noah got off the ark for the first time, God gave them the authority. If you were guilty of murder, you, were, you also had the ability to put a man to death if he was actually guilty of first-degree murder. We see when Paul wrote his letter to, to Timothy that the purpose of civil government was that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We see Peter's letter to the dispersed that the civil government was sent by God to punish 
evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Look at Psalm 82 as another example. I didn't have time to put that in there. Pastor Nathaniel Appleton, also of Boston, said this, Government was instituted by God for the good of mankind. If a ruler acts selfishly or oppressively, he acts quite contrary to the original design of the government and contrary to the express will of him and from whence all power and authority are derived. So, point number one. <clears throat> The will of God for government is to punish evil and to protect the good that we may live peaceably in all godliness. Now, let me ask you a quick question here. Pop quiz. Does every government get it right? Okay, let me give you an example here, and, and we'll compare the two. Did God design the family? Was the family God's idea? Was it a good idea? Are children supposed to obey their parents? So, if... Dad tells Johnny, Johnny, I need you to go out and mow the yard for me, son. What's Johnny supposed to do? What if Dad says, Johnny, run a little short this month. I want you to take this uh, 357 Magnum and go down and rob the liquor store. What's Johnny supposed to do? But wait a second. The Bible says children obey your parents, does it not? In the Lord. That's exactly right. And if that government becomes uh, perverse then Johnny's responsible is to disobey a perverse ruling. The same thing is true, we're going to show you, with civil government as well. All right, point number two. There is right and wrong. There is a standard of absolute truth. Mr. Jefferson, in constructing the Declaration of Independence, said this, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have bound them to another, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them. Let me stop right there and make this point. The whole justification for the 13 colonies seceding from the tyranny of Great Britain was based upon this phrase, the laws of nature and nature's God. Probably pretty important that we know what that phrase means. Well, this man was a man named William Blackstone. He was a rock star in the days of, of the colonialism. Uh, he wrote a four-volume set of commentaries uh, called Blackstone's Commentaries on Law. And every term and expression that we see in our Declaration of Independence is not just poetic prose from some 18th century author. Every term is actually a legal term defined by Blackstone. So the people of the day knew exactly what was being said. So we can see for ourselves what natural law means. Blackstone said this, Man, considered as a creation of God, must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is entirely a dependent being. And consequently, as man depends absolutely upon his maker for everything, it is necessary that he should in all points conform to the will of his maker. This will of his maker is called natural law, the law of nature. Now, we know a lot of natural law. Gravity is natural law. We can observe that. But what about the specifics? What about the definition of the family? What about right and wrong? What about the intricacies of uh, the things that we can't just physically observe? Well, those details are revealed in divine law, and they are to be found only in the holy scriptures. No human laws should be suffered to contradict a biblical law. So our founding fathers believed this. If God had spoken, the matter was settled. In areas where God hadn't spoken, then that's where man was free to legislate. So, for example, what should the speed limit be on I-4? Well, we know it should be 100. But we know it's actually 1. One mile an hour is about as much speed as you can get on I-4 because it's been a, road, a traffic jam for 12 years since I've been coming down to visit Florida. No, we are free to legislate on that because you can read from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find anywhere that God has addressed the question what the speed limit should be on I-4. But let me ask you this question. What is the definition of a marriage? One man, one woman. And if God has spoken, no person has the authority or the audacity to try to overrule God. By the way, according to the pages of Scripture, thank you. According to the pages of Scripture, Christian, you call yourself a Christ follower, remember? How many genders are there? 
God created them male and female, male and female created he them. When God has spoken, we don't have the authority to overrule him. As a matter of fact, James Wilson, one of our original three Supreme Court justices, said just that. Human law must rest its authority ultimately on the authority of that law which is divine. Alexander Hamilton literally quoted Blackstone saying, No human laws are valid if they are contrary or contradict God's law. So point number two, there is absolute truth. There is right and wrong. There is a foundation upon which America was built. That is the Bible. And remember this, our rights come from God, and no one has a right to do wrong. Let that sink in as you drive home Wednesday. Point number three, the importance of a written constitution dividing the rule of law for everyone. Well, you say, you've jumped the shark there, Pastor. Where did you find that in the pages of Scripture? Well, right here in Deuteronomy 17. Long before Israel was ever dumb enough to ask for a king, God gave them instruction for what they should do when they did. And God said, before that man assumes his position on the throne, he's supposed to take a copy of the Constitution, the law, and he is supposed to read all of it. And then I want him to write it out in his own hand, and I want him to refer to it every day. And he's supposed to keep it every day and do them. And this king doesn't have the authority to do what he wants to do. He is bound by the law, and he can't deviate from it to the right or to the left. He is literally a limited government. The Constitution defines and limits what the government can and cannot do. Now, again, let's go back to Blackstone. Blackstone believed that if man lived in a state of nature, we would have no need of civil law, but we still would be subject to natural law. So let me explain what that's talking about. If I lived all by myself on a deserted island, I'm the only one on the island, would I need to have a council meeting with myself and pass a curfew ordinance? Nope. I'm the only one there. I'm not going to keep myself up all night playing loud music. Would I need a stoplight? Nope. I'm the only one there. There's no cross traffic. So if I lived in a state of nature, I wouldn't need civil law. However, would I still be subject to God's laws of nature? So I couldn't just defy gravity and fly off the island, could I? No. Man living in a state of nature wouldn't even need civil law. But he does need civil law if he lives in a civil body politic. So considering there is no divine right of kings, who has the right to rule over another man? No one. So how do we establish a civil government? We, the people, come together and constitute one. Notice what that word constitution means. Inaugurate, establish, initiate, found, create, set up, start, form, organize, develop, commission, charter, invest, appoint, install, empower. We, the people, agree together on a limited civil government. We, the people, delegate few and divine powers to that government of our creation. And we pledge to submit, not to the king, but we submit to uphold the rule of law. Again, we're not subjecting ourselves to unlimited rule by man or men. We are a republic. We're ruled by law. By the way, we are not a democracy. Let me give you an example of a democracy. A democracy was the trial of Jesus Christ. We had an innocent man standing before the Jewish crowd there in the court of Gentiles, probably up on Antonio Fortress Wall with Pilate, and the people voted unanimously to free a guilty man and to convict an innocent man, and it was done through the democratic process. That is an example of democracy. Democracy can trample a person's rights just as quickly as an individual tyrant can. We are a republic. As a matter of fact, that is what was so unique about the Mayflower Compact. They got blown off course. They weren't landing where they had the legal authority to land. So if they landed there at Cape Cod, they actually would have been in a state of anarchy. And they knew they couldn't survive. So for the first time in world history, you had a bunch of equals came together and they drafted their own constitution. Then 41 men signed their signatures and agreed to be ruled by that rule of law. 
Now, we're going to go very quickly through a couple of these slides. Pastor Davenport talking about how all authority comes from we the people. Thomas Hooker, Pastor Thomas Hooker, the founder of Connecticut, says all authority comes from the people, not from the government. Pastor Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, says all the authority comes from we the people, not they the government. So, these are the points I want to make right now in passing. The purpose is, the purpose of a government is for the good of mankind, not tyranny, to punish evil and to protect the good that we may live peaceably in all godliness, to secure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Point number two, God is the ultimate lawmaker. The foundation of truth for America is the laws of nature and nature's God. Point number three, all power comes from the people. They create a limited general government, delegate few and define powers to that government, and then since they are the ones that created this government, they know how much government they've got, they know what they've got to pay for, they choose to tax themselves a proper amount to fund the proper principles of government that they want. Now, going back in history, our, our uh, founding fathers, when they first came to the New World, were actually free men, but they were under the King of England. Over time, their charters were broken. Because the king said, I'm the king, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Over the time, the, the king voided their legislatures. He uh, became oppressive in trade law. He levied taxes without representation. Now understand this. Here's what the point is. The tea tax wasn't much at all. But imagine we are in this room and we're starting our own government. We're going to call it the government of the... What room are we in anyway? I don't even know. What, what is it? Coast. All right. The new coastal government. All right, and you all have elected me as king for the day. Let's say that I say as king, uh, I demand that you give me a dollar. I order you to give me a dollar. Well, if you go along with that, then you have just established the right that I can take from you whatever I want, whenever I want. So, in fact, you no longer have anything yourself. It all belongs to me because I can just take it from you whenever I want. See, the whole point of taxation is that the people are responsible enough to understand what government they need and that's got to be paid for some way, and they figure out a way to pay for it. It's not up to the government to decide how big it's going to be and then tell us how much of our money we get to keep. If the government establishes that principle where the government gets to dictate how much of your money you get to keep, you just became a slave. Because if I can take one dollar, why can't I take half of what you make? In fact, if I've got enough police or military with me and I'm corrupt, why can't I take all of what you make? So that was the principle that really got these men. Now, what we aren't taught about, as I said a while ago, civil and religious liberty travel together. The other thing that the king was planning on doing was reestablishing the Church of England over the colonies. As a matter of fact, that leading light of the first Great Awakening, George Whitfield, came to New England in 1764 to warn the New England pastors of the plot that was developing in Parliament and the King that he was going to force the reestablishment of the Church of England over all 13 colonies and control what the pastors were preaching. Why? Because he knew about these black robed regiment pastors that were stirring the people's hearts to liberty and he was wanting to regain control of the pulpits. Remember, civil liberty and religious liberty always travel as a pair. If you lose one, you lose them both 100% of the time. Again, that's what we talked about last night. It wasn't Dan's presentation last night phenomenal. It was the pastors that recognized what was going on. And it was the pastors that stood up and said no. So, now, we know about that history. We've learned these few principles. What are we going to do in our day and age? How can we practically make a difference? Well, there's going to be several things that we're going to teach you over the next two days. But let me give you one. First of all, going along with what I said last night, what does it mean to live by faith? Living by faith means trusting God. God says to do it this way. If I don't trust God, I'm not going to do it that way. If I trust God, I'm going to do it the way He told me to do it. That's what Proverbs 3, 5 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> don't trust your own self. You'll deceive yourself. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways because He will direct your path. It's what we talked about last night. I'm going to save that whole 40 minutes and just put that verse up. We've got to sit down. 
Ephesians 5. Of course, you all know the Bible is very practical, and every New Testament epistle was written dealing with a practical, tangible issue that was going on with that church and that community. Well, Ephesians is a pretty comprehensive letter written about the church to the church. Ephesians chapter 5, this is as relevant to us as it was to the congregation in Ephesus when they received it. And here's some of the instruction. By the way, it was just after a passage with gross sexual misconduct and all sorts of bad behavior that Paul was saying don't be a part of. It says this as he summarizes, have no fellowship with. What does that word mean? Don't share in, don't participate with, don't be a party of. Unfruitful works of darkness. As a matter of fact, not only do I not want you not to be a party of it, but I want you to actively rebuke it, expose it, and stand against it. Is that pretty clear? Okay. And you can see, this is not the words of this Paul. This is the divinely inspired words of the Apostle Paul. Okay. Is everybody in agreement? Does anybody disagree? Anybody want to challenge me on this verse? All right. Okay. By the way, we're Christ followers, at least we profess to be. That is a direct quote from the Democratic Party platform. Go ahead and read it, Christ follower. Strongly, unequivocally supports Roe versus Wade and a woman's right to make decisions regarding her pregnancy. In other words, to kill her baby, including a safe legal abortion, regardless of the ability to pay. We oppose any and all efforts to weaken and undermine that right. That is actually an aborted baby. Look at that little rascal. You know what that is? That's premeditated murder. You can't call it anything else. If you are, you're just lying to yourself. And if you're going to lie to yourself about that, you have no reason, no authority to be in the ministry. I would encourage you to go home and resign your pulpit right, right away. Yeah. Christian, don't be a party of unfruitful works of darkness. In fact, I want you to stand against them because we're followers of Christ. Hmm. If only the Bible had something to say about sexuality, huh? If only the Bible said anything about homosexuality, LGBT, cross-dressing. Boy, I just wish it did. Oh, it does. How can you say, I'm following Christ in my politics, and then be a party of a party that has this clearly written in its platform? And by the way, I don't want you to get mad at me. I didn't write this. This is the Democratic Party platform, and I've just quoted pages of Scripture. So if you're ticked off, that's between you and God. And trust me, you can fight with him all you want. You're going to lose. Every Democrat member of the House of Representatives signed off as a co-sponsor of the Equality Act. You know what the Equality Act is? Equality Act adds LGBTQ plus to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Let me ask you all a question. How many of you are relatively good businessmen or uh, understand principles of business? Okay. How many of you would sign a contract that had an open paragraph, say Section G, and the other person said, oh, don't worry about that. Go ahead and sign your name. I'll fill that in later. Do you know what the plus means on LGBTQ plus? Anything they want to add to it, including, I promise you, polygamy, polyamory, bestiality, pedophilia, and any and every kind of perversion that man's wicked mind can think of. And that will be guaranteed as a civil right. Now, I've got some news for you. I know a lot of, of former homosexuals. In fact, we've got two in our church, uh, one man that actually leads a ministry called First Stone Ministry that was saved radically out of the homosexual lifestyle about to 35 years ago, got married, raised kids, wonderful man of God. 
We've got a young lady in our church that was raised in a very fundamental Southern Baptist home. She wound up becoming a transgender, actually went through all sorts of, of uh, hormone therapy, and she actually had a beard at one time. She got saved, came back around. Now she's a lovely young lady that also works in our church and church ministry. I know a lot of, of former homosexuals, people who have gotten saved out of that behavior and changed their behavior. You know what? As an ex-football player, I shared a, lo a locker room with a lot of black athletes. A lot of my best friends are black athletes. I don't know of anybody that used to be black. You're either born black, born white, born Latino, born whatever. We all, you trace our genealogies back far enough, we come to the same couple. Well, you Republicans are just insensitive. Republicans vow to repeal tax reform, putting taxes in focus. I am so tired of hearing uh, fairness, everybody paying their fair share. Let me explain to this. You know what would be fair? is a flat tax. You know what they had in the Bible? A tithe, multiple tithes. And if you made 10 bucks, you gave one buck. If you made a million dollars, you paid $100,000. That's fair. It's everybody equally. The government has no money. When you show up to work, you're the one that develops those sermons. You're the one that goes to the hospital. You're the one that counsels those that need counseling. Uh, you're the one that preaches the messages. You earn a living. I haven't had the government show up and preach one funeral for me. Oh, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. You step aside, Pastor. In fact, go home for the day. I've got this one. Not once. I earn my money. You earn your money. They have none. The only money they have is what they take from you in taxes or what they borrow and we are on, uh, obligated to repay or quite frankly, our great, 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 great grandchildren are now obligated to repay because the debt has gotten so excessive. And they don't have the authority to spend money unless it's limit, defined in the Constitution. So most of what the government does today is illegal but we've all been trained in government schools, so we don't know to object. We just go along with it. Well, what's some hard economic truth? Well, Jesus said in this parable that hard work and success is rewarded and slothfulness is to be rebuked. Here's an example of some money managers. Let me ask you this. Let's say you invested some money with Timothy Plan and you got a 25% return on your investment one year. And let's say you invested some money with New York Life. I hope nobody works for New York Life. Okay, how about Joe Biden Life Insurance Company? How's that? Okay. And you lost 20% of money in the same year. What would you do if you're trying to prepare for your retirement? You would take all your money. You wouldn't double down what you've given Biden. You would take the money out of that account and you'd invest it in Timothy because that money manager is doing a good job. So biblically, slothfulness is always rebuked. Try reading through the Proverbs. About every other verse deals with that. And hard work is rewarded and praised. Bible says this. We as Christians, work hard, mind your own business, and support your own family. It's not my responsibility to, to support your children. It's your responsibility to support your children. By the way, understand a basic principle of economics is this. If you want less of something, you tax it. That's why they have sin taxes. In Oklahoma, there's like $3, uh, a, three, $3 a, a pack of cigarettes uh, tax because they want to get people to smoke less because they, they, they want people to stop you know, causing lung cancer, things of that nature. But taxes promote less of something Subsidies increase something. So why is it we subsidize unwed mothers and we tax incrementally higher successful businesses? The natural outcome is going to be saying we want less business and more illegitimate pregnancies. Think, people. We've got to become critical thinkers, Pastor. What does Paul say? Here's what we command you. If anybody refuses to work, then let him go hungry. Well, he'll get back to work before long. Those which walk among you are disorderly or working not at all. They're nothing but busybodies. 
Now them that are such, we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with keep your mouth shut, work hard, pay your own bills, feed yourself. Don't get tired of doing the right thing the right way. Does anybody want to disagree with me of that? Did this Paul write that? No, the Apostle Paul wrote that. What about charity? As I said last night, not one single case where the government goes in and takes from those and say, you have too much, we're going to give it to these that refuse to work. In every situation, just like in this one, there was a famine in the land in the early days of the church. And it says in Acts chapter 11, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch, uh, unto Antioch. And there stood one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth or famine throughout all the world, which did come to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the Christ followers, every man, every man, not just the rich man, Every man according to his ability. Well, I can give a thousand dollars, or I can give, I can put in a quarter. Great. Every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders, elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Done through the church. Notice it was distributed and managed through the elders of the church. Now, are there some we're supposed to help? Absolutely. Boy, you'll see widows and orphans mentioned many times in the Bible. Those that really are, are dealing with some, some struggles. Boy, that's where the body of Christ really needs to come together and help in those areas. By the way, withhold not good from them to whom it is due. Whenever you've got somebody comes to you in your church, first thing we do, if we've got somebody in our church that has uh, money issues, by the way, we do this a lot, and we do it confidentially, Nobody in our church knows anything else about anybody else's business. First thing we have them do is fill out a budget. I want to see if it's just a problem this month because of some disaster, some, or if they aren't managing their money well. And we look at their budget. We say, well, look at here. Hey, you might want to, have you ever thought about selling that S550 Mercedes? <laughs> Let's say I see $1,000 in lotto tickets every month. Okay, not everyone is due. Helping some people may be enabling them. We had one man years ago that came to me and we helped him, paid his rent one month, and then a couple of months later I got word that he was going through a Sunday school class, talking confidentially to every member of the class. I brought him into the office, sat down with a couple of deacons, came to find out that this 50-something-year-old man raising his son by himself was a crack addict. And unless we had had that conversation, we probably wouldn't have discovered it for months because we had no idea. But he was going to one individual after another and hitting them up and everybody having good nature, wanting to help him. All we were doing were enabling him. But handling it properly through the channel of the church, we were able to address the issue. His son moved in with Cindy and me. We raised him for a year, put him in private Christian school with our boys. He went off to a, a drug rehabilitation facility and had one of those happily ever after endings. Now, let me give you a couple, just a couple more things. I've only got about six more minutes. This came up, of course, last year. Black Lives Matter. Folks, let me just ask you this. If you want to be objective, put any other color there and see if it's racist or not. If I was to come in and say, white lives matter, I'd be called a racist. If I was to come in and say, hey, I want to start the White Entertainment Network or the United White Guy College Fund. I would be called a racist. We are all equal people. We're all descendants of Adam created in God's image. Listen to the testimony of one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. I think that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, well, that, that's first um, on sort of ideological theories. So uh, basically, she just flat out said it. That's what they're out, and she mentions uh, Alicia. That's another founder, one of the two. Of the show. that's two founders, right? That she's she didn't mention the other, uh, but two of them are, admit, are admitting right, right there, like the, their ideological foundation, their ideological foundation 
is Marxism. The trained Marxism. That's exactly what she, she just made it. She just said it. That wasn't a secret. That I mean, I, I've long known that, but for those of you that have been on the fence with this, you heard it from the horse's mouth. So this is why it's not actually even a co-op. So even sometimes I misspeak and I kind of su suggest that. I don't necessarily just say that. But I kind of allude to it, let's say that. But it's not necessarily a co-op when we talk about these like white leftist communists and so forth. It's not a co-op. That's what they believe in. So all of you crackheads that have been centering your last two weeks of your life around donating to this organization... You need to understand what you've been funding. You have been funding Marxism. Okay? That's not a, no, it's not a secret. Tomorrow morning I'm going to do a brief on Marxism as we start the day. Uh, understand that Karl Marx wanted to create a revolution. He wanted a war out of which the current system would collapse and he could reestablish his own Marxist utopia. He didn't care. when well, His thought was creating strife between property owners and non-property owners. Now we have critical theory. As long as there's conflict, they don't care what it is, they just want conflict out of which you have a revolution and then you throw off the current economic system and replace it with this communist utopia. Critical race theory is the biggest tool that they're using against the United States of America. But understand, Marx was frustrated because he couldn't get his people to revolt. Once laborers got a pay raise, they wanted to get back to work. They weren't interested in revolution. So he hired, or his plan was to hire community organizers. Those to continually stir the pot and provoke a revolution. Folks, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, but I'd never even heard the term community organizer until I was introduced to a young man from Chicago that wound up becoming president of the United States. Those two ladies, two of the three ladies started BLM. Community organizers, they're trained organizers, they're trained Marxists. Now, when they had that website, if you push the donate button, it would take you to Act Blue Charities. That's the 501c3. What's Act Blue? Act Blue is a Democrat fundraising party. Uh, who do they support? They support Bernie, the Socialist, 2020. Biden, the Socialist. Elizabeth Warren, the Socialist. Pete for America, the Socialist. Uh, you see some of their major sponsors. George Soros, perhaps the most wicked man on planet Earth. The apartment right next to Satan in hell itself will be occupied by Soros and Hitler, I'm quite sure. All right? Democratic Socialists of America, moveon.org, NARAL, pro-choice, Planned Parenthood. Money that's going to BLM is funding Planned Parenthood. Are you kidding me? By the way, according to this website, blackgenocide.org, there are some 1,800 black babies killed every day, and we call it abortion. Don't those black lives matter? What about this one weekend in Chicago? Since we got so smart and said, oh, the police are just out roaming the streets on, on hunting trips looking for innocent black men to shoot, We've got to defund the police. We had in one weekend 24 black kids killed in one weekend. Don't those black lives matter? Now remember that 24. We're going to come back to it. And we're going to crash land this plane here in about 60 seconds. One of the ladies that started Black Lives Matter also was the founder of Back the Ballot. That's her over here, Alicia Garza. You push on the 501c3. You want to donate to Black Future Labs. It goes to the Chinese Progressive Association, for Pete's sake. The 501c3 is the Chinese Communist Party. Are you kidding me? Now, we're told that America is systematically racist. And understand why that's important. Are there racists? Sure. There are racists of every skin color. And it's wicked. But in 2008... We elected a black man to be the president of the United States. And 43% of white voters voted for a black man to be president of the United States. That doesn't indicate that the system is racist. But see, under Marxism, the system has to be racist because we want to destroy the system. 
so we can recreate our communist utopia. 95%, huh, that's interesting. Christians. Now, we're told that black men are targeted on the streets. In fact, we know it's true because LeBron James said so. This is actually an FBI report from 2015. 2015, now remember that number I showed you a minute ago. We had 24 black kids killed in one weekend in Chicago. In 2015, there were 17 black men that were killed by police that were not armed. So there were, set, out of 335 million citizens in the United States, over 365 days, there were 17 incidents where a black man was killed, an unarmed black man was killed. Now generally, when we're interacting with police, it's usually because somebody's done something wrong. We honor the police every year, or give them, feed them lunch and do that stuff, but usually when I'm interacting with the police, it's because I've been speeding. So usually when there's an interaction with the police, it's not a good thing. Something is troubling to begin with. But you had 17. By the way, we had 28 white people, white men killed in the same fashion over the same year. But in one weekend, we had 24 killed in Chicago. Nobody said anything about it. Ladies, gentlemen, understand. This whole last year has been nothing that's why I've been grieved by it, because I know this stuff politically. I'm a student of politics. I'm a student of history. I'm a student of the Bible. I see nothing more than a well-executed Marxist takedown of the United States of America. And our only response is that we must be sons of Issachar. And understand those sons of Issachar, this is a political situation. There was a decision after the death of Saul's son, should all 12 tribes follow David? Right now, only Judah was following David. Should everybody else come together and follow David? Or should they go ahead and follow another of Saul's son? The sons of Issachar, only 200 of them, had such influence and had such political understanding of the times that those 200 men were able to sway the 12 tribes of Israel to do what God wanted them to do and follow a man after God's own heart. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of this session.